precious name, amen. Have you ever noticed how, how, there's a, a, the, how this world craves a, a, super, a superhero? We, we love superheroes, right? I mean, there's all kinds of them out there. Uh, Hollywood has spent millions and millions of dollars on developing, putting together films of Superman and Batman and, and uh, the Fantastic Four and some of my favorites. And, uh, you know, these, these superheroes that are going to come and they're going to they're gonna save people from the bad guys, right? And uh, the world, world's looking for that. And some believe that, you know, there's conspiracy theories out there. Some believe that, the, that this is all a ploy of the enemy, how he's preparing the world for this superhero that would one day come. And, and it's this antichrist. The Bible teaches that. In fact, we're going to look at it this morning where John brings this issue up. But if you're a believer here this morning, you have a superhero, super duper hero. And he's your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And, and I got to tell you, the scripture teaches that he is coming again, but when he comes again, it's not going to be a pretty sight if you don't know him. If you're not a part of his church that he's redeemed by his blood. There's going to be a, a rude awakening for a world without Christ. And that's why we want people to know Christ. We want to reach out to people because when Jesus comes back again, uh, Revelation 19 depicts the rider on the white horse. And it's Christ and he's coming back to, to do away with the Antichrist and the false prophet and all those who have chosen to follow him. And it's, it's not going to be a pretty sight. Uh, I used to tell my kids, you know, we, we watched this movie one time called The War of the World. You ever seen that? The aliens, you know, these, these uh, aliens that are wiping out the whole human race, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, those, those beams, you know. It kind of sounds like, you know, and those, those tripods that come up and they're just wiping everybody out and they're the bad guys. But, you know, in a sense, that's kind of how it's going to be like when Christ comes back again. He's going to deal with all this wickedness. And there's going to be a place on this planet that's a place of peace and he's going to reign for a thousand years and, and believers in Christ are going to reign with him. And it's going to be a time of peace like we've never ever seen before. But until then, well, let's look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And as you're turning to 1 John 2, I'm going to run down and get my water that I always forget. I always do that. <laughs> Oh, it's there. <laughs> well, what am I doing with you? I think somebody tricked me on this one. I, it's there. It's a miracle. <laughs> oh, I'll say this one and use this one for the Oh, wow, weird. Okay. I get that dry mouth up here. It's just that little bit of elevation, I think. That, anyway. <laughs> so I'm in 1 John chapter 2. And uh, we're going to start with verse 18, because that's kind of where we, we left off verse 17 a couple weeks back. John says here, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. 
if what you have heard, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you then you too will abide in the son and in the father and this is the promise that he made to us eternal life i write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you but the anointing that you received from him abides in you and you need and you have no need for anyone that should teach you but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And verse 28, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you, know, you, know, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So here John brings up this issue of Antichrist. Now notice he says from the get-go, he says, children, this is the last hour. He's addressing the children. He's addressing, there's two ways to look at this. He may be referring to children in the sense that these were new Christians. They were kind of in that children state. They were babes in Christ, maybe. But I think more of, he's referring to children as being the entire family of God, the children of God. So I think he's dressing young, middle-aged, old Christians alike. And, but he says, children, listen, this is the last hour. Now remember, folks, this was written some 2,000 years ago, right? And John's saying that this is the last hour. What do you think's up with that? Well, we know that Scripture teaches that, that Jesus Christ at His first coming marked the beginning of the end. And we see that in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, where, where the writer of Hebrews says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But then he says this. He says, But in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son. So the writer of Hebrews is saying that, that Jesus Christ marked the beginning of the end. The last days, the last hour. I think they're one and the same. And then we know in, in, in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul addressing the, the Christians. He says, he says, but mark this. Mark this. There will be terrible, perilous times in the last days. And so folks, we, I think, we are living in the the latter part of the last days. Now, people have been saying that for a long, long time. I've been saying that for ever since I've been a Christian. But that's only been a few years compared to the history of this world, right? So when we think of last day, yeah, we've been saying that. Well, why, yeah, we are living in the end times. And you know, one of the keys, just to give you a little footnote here, one of the, I believe the keys of God's time clock is the nation Israel. Keep your eyes on Israel. Uh, they're the key that opened the whole, the whole deal. So uh, that's really interesting, a, a very interesting study. But he says, listen, we're living in these last days and, and Antichrist is coming. Antichrist, singular. And then he says, and many Antichrists, plural, are already here, is basically what he's saying. Now, folks, we know, and you know this if you're a believer and a student of the Word of God, that there is an Antichrist singular that is yet to come. He's yet to come. The Bible speaks of him. But there's also many Antichrists that have been here since the beginning. Beginning of what? The beginning of Christ's ministry. Folks, anybody that denies the Son of, of God is considered biblically an antichrist. An antichrist. Acts 20, 29. Remember Paul? He was so concerned about the church. And he says, you know, when I leave, I'm just concerned about these, these savage wolves that will, that will come in here and creep into the flock and, and not spare the flock and lead many of you astray. Paul was concerned about that. These savage wolves, these anti-Christs who would come in. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, watch out. 
Be careful, speaking to the people of God. He says, watch out, people, that, that you, these false prophets, that, that they don't come in and, and lead you astray. They're going to be dressed in, in sheep's clothing. They're going to look good. They're going to have the, maybe some of the right terminology and all that. But inwardly, he says, listen, they're ferocious wolves. He says, watch out, be careful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Verses 14 and 15, Paul says there's something about Satan. He says even Satan, he, he disguises himself. He masquerades as an angel of light. So it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their, their end will correspond to their deeds, Paul says. There's not a good outcome for those, for those who are following the enemy, following Satan. It's not going to be a good ending. But Paul says, be careful. Be careful. Satan, you know, he doesn't, I don't think he comes across with the big, you know, horns and the pitchfork and the red suit and all that, you know. I, he's disguising himself. He's disguising himself in our culture like you wouldn't believe. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we're not taken in. So there are many antichrists, but then there, we know the antichrist singular is coming. Daniel 7 speaks of this, of this antichrist, this vision that, that Daniel had. Remember that? And he had the vision of, of these four heads, and each head was a beast, kind of a strange looking beast. But the fourth beast, he couldn't even describe. It, it was, it was the, the most terrifying, the most dreadful of the, of the four. And, and this, this beast had ten horns. But there was this one particular horn that he called the little horn that came up. And it was able to take out the first three horns. And he goes on with this weird vision. But most Bible scholars believe that that horn represents the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness who is, who is yet to come. Paul talks about this in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, turn over there with me just for a moment. Let me read a chunk of scripture here because I think it's important to see this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 1. Paul says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind and, or alarmed, either by spirit or a, or a word spoken or a letter seeming to be, to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. In other words, he says, don't worry about these false letters, these false words, these false preachers that are saying, hey, it's already over. The day of the Lord has already come. Paul says, no. He says, let no one deceive you, verse 3, in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion occur, comes first and then the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him, what is keeping him from coming out, so that he may be revealed in its time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now re restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. That's a very controversial verse. Verse 8. And then the man, the lawlessness one, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow! 
There's a lot there about eschatology, the study of the last times that Paul is bringing out here. But he talks about this day of the Lord that's coming and how there's this, this false teaching out there that's already come. Paul says, no, it's not going to come until two things happen. One, the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. And the second is what? The rebellion, the apostasy has to take place. And folks, well, that hasn't happened yet. Or has it? I don't think the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, nobody really knows who he is. People are guessing and all this kind of stuff. Oh, you know, it's, it's Trump or it's so-and-so or it's this guy or it's that guy. And you're going, well, come on. You'll know when he comes. As a Christian, you'll know. But, but this guy here, he's going to, it says that he sets himself up in the temple. Does that ring a bell? Old Testament, for you scholars out there, Daniel 7. Remember that? The abomination of desolation that Jesus talked about in, in Matthew. He talked about this one who would come and he'd make this pact with Israel. But he'd come into this temple which they haven't built. Many believe if you're a... You know, there, again, folks, there's different takes on this. I'm taking kind of a, a predestined type position, although I am kind of a post. Now I've got you all confused. But this, the Jesus taught that this one would come and he'd set himself up in the temple that's yet to be built and he will declare himself to be God. But at that time, he's going to break his pact with Israel and he's going to be seen for who he truly is. The enemy himself. The devil incarnate. The anti-Christ. And it's going to be a terrible time for a time. For a period that the Bible speaks of the tribulation. But Jesus is going to overthrow this guy. At the very coming, at the second coming of Jesus when he comes in the cloud. He's going to come back and he's going to deal with this guy once and for all. He overcomes him with the breath of his mouth. I believe that speaks of his word. He doesn't need any physical weapon to do warfare with the enemy. He is omnipotence in himself. He speaks and things happen. Whatever he says will take place. And he's going to deal with the enemy simply by his powerful word. He'll take care of him once and for all. But until then, there's going to be deception. There's going to be things going on. And I believe, folks, that one of his major attacks today is the church of Jesus Christ. Some have said, well, we've got to wait. What is this apostasy thing that has to take place first? Apostasy is turning away. That's what it means. A turning away of the faith. You know, personally, my take is that there is a kind of apostasy that's already taken place today. There's a turning away of the truth. There's a turning away of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. There's this idea out there that you can become a Christian yet still hang on to your sin. Or that you can become a Christian and not deal with repentance. Or that you can become a Christian by simply just, oh, you know, mouthing this prayer. And that's it. You know, like the, the sacredness is in the prayer. This is going to save you. No. The prayer doesn't save anybody. It's the object, right? The object of our prayer. It's Jesus. But, the, you know, people say, well, you know, if it's, if it's anything other than grace, then it's works. And, and that's true. Absolutely true. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But saving faith is never alone, if it's true, if it's real. And Jesus said, you know what? If you want to become one of mine, if you want eternal life, you lose your life. Ooh, that sounds kind of weird. What's that? I want to hang on to my life. And there's this idea out there that I can still be the, in the driver's seat of my life and be a Christian. No, that's not true. We come to Christ, we are relinquishing the right to be the God of our lives. We are handing that, that reign over to Christ. We're saying, Lord, you are my master. And folks, I wonder how many believers in the church have really done that today. I wonder how many believers in the church today have truly turned from sin 
and turned to the Lord Jesus in faith, have let go of their life and said, Lord, my life is yours. You bought me with a price, and that price was your blood. I belong to you. You see, that's what it means. You, if you want to find life, you lose it. And if you lose life for my sake, Jesus said, you find it. That's serious stuff, isn't it? But again, I believe there's this kind of a turning away today of the true gospel of Jesus like we've never seen before. It's called easy believism. It's called the name it, claim it gospel. It's got all kinds of names, but it's disguised as the real thing. Be careful of that. Be very, very careful of that because I think before we see Jesus come again, that is going to increase like we've never seen before. So the Bible teaches that, that this, this man of lawlessness will come, that there will be this apostasy in the end times, right? Folks, don't be surprised at the wickedness that you see. Don't let it, oh, like it's caught you by, you know, the Word of God teaches that we should be prepared. In fact, let me turn you to a couple more verses I want you to read with me. I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to see it in the Word of God. First Thessalonians, back to Thessalonians, but the first book, chapter 5. Well, actually, I'm going to go to chapter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 13. And I'm going to read a chunk here again. Paul says here, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, meaning those who have died, those who have died, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or who have died. For this we declare to you by, by a word from the Lord, that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord, praise God. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Verse chapter 5, he says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you would have no need to have anything written to you. In other words, you should know this, he says. For you know yourselves, you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will not come, or the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying peace and security and safety. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brother, for, you, for, that, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep. And then there the word sleep, I think, is used in a different way. He's talking about do not be ignorant. Do not be, do not be in the darkness. He says do not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, praise God, <laughs> but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Again, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So folks, Scripture seems to indicate that there are kind of two phases to Christ's coming. That the first phase is that Christ is coming for his people, the church. Now when this happens, it's, there's debate. Some believe that it's before the tribulation starts, that's the pre-tribs. Some believe it's right in the middle of that seven-year tribulation. And some believe it's at the end of the tribulation. There's, there's pre, mid, post. 
And I've, I used to be a real die in the heart pre guy. But then I, as I studied scripture and started, you know, learning other things and listening, and I, I kind of moved to more of a post position. Amen. And then I started moving back into the mid position. And then I came up with a whole new theory. <laughs> I believe in the pan position. It's all going to pan out at the end. And it's true. No, I didn't come up with that. Somebody else did. But, but it's a cop out, I know. Uh, but you know, the, as you look at scripture, Christ is coming again for his church. When? Not positively sure, but he's coming. And there's going to be a trumpet that sounds. And it's going to happen just like that. Well, twinkle of the night. Twink once. That's fast. And we are going to be caught up with him. But what's going to happen is we're going to come back with him at his second coming and we are going to reign with him. I think we see that in Revelation 19. The rider on the white horse, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the armies are following behind it, the armies of heaven. I think that's the church. I think that's the Old Testament saints. I think that's the angelic beings. All of them are coming back with the Lord to the earth to deal with the enemy. But the interesting thing in Revelation, if you're a Christian here today, you get to wear a white robe. Which probably means we don't do any of the battling at all. It's Jesus that does all the battling. We're going to be, we're going to be basically spectators. And what a sight it's going to be. It's going to be awesome. But folks, I don't want anybody that, that doesn't know Jesus to have to go through that. Do you? That's why we need to get out there. And we need to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a way out, folks. But that time is getting short. And if you noticed back in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, when he talks about the coming of the Antichrist and the coming of the day of the Lord, this time of God's wrath on the earth, that there's a restraining power that's keeping him back, it says. And it says, he who restrains him, he who holds him back, will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Now there's debate on what that is. Who is the pronoun? Who's he? He will hold him back. He's the I, Personally, I believe that he is the Holy Spirit's ministry through the, through the church of Jesus Christ. And when we are taken out of the way, then Antichrist will step on the scene and have his way for a time. He'll have his way for a time. That word hour, the, the last hour. Just, remember Jesus, when he was arrested, they came to him in the garden. I love this, how John records it. And they come to him, and we know who he is. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And here are these, these Pharisees and these teachers of the law and these temple policemen or whatever they were. They come with clubs and swords, and they're ready to do battle. There was probably some believe there was somewhere around, you know, 1,500 to 1,000 of these guys coming to arrest Jesus. Man, they were ready for a war because they knew, they knew about this guy. They, they knew some of the miracles that he had done. Or, and so they were a little bit afraid. And they come to him, and Jesus is there. And he says, to whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember? And he says, I am. In the original, that's what it says. I am. We've added the pronoun he. I am he. But what he really said is the same thing God said to Moses in, in Exodus 3. Remember? <laughs> Moses, don't be afraid. You tell them that I am has sent you. I am who I am. That, that, is a, that is a statement of the Almighty God. Jesus in that garden was claiming to be the great I am of the Old Testament. And something happened. I don't know what it was. A little mystery here. Maybe it was, maybe, maybe he just gave them a little peek of his glory because something had, they all fell back to the ground. They didn't just step back. Poof, they fell back. And then he made a statement. He said this. This is now your hour. And the hour of darkness. When darkness reigns. This is the last hour. This is, Satan, you've got one hour. And it's over. And we know. We know what happened to our Lord in the, 
in the temple courts and how they beat him and whipped him and did all those things and how he went to the cross. We don't have detailed, detailed verbiage of what actually happened with the Satan and the, and, the, and the forces of darkness, but we do know this, that the, that, the, that the world became dark for a time when he hung on that cross. And what was going on, I, I don't know. We could only surmise. But whatever was happening, the Father God, Father was allowing that to be unleashed on His Son. And the Father too unleashed His fury on His Son. So the enemy not only got His way, but the Father had to judge sin in His Son once and for all. Folks, we can't even begin to fathom what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. Whatever happened, Charles Spurgeon once said, it had to be equivalent to eternity in hell, whatever it was. And can you, I mean, we wonder, why did he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the Father let the enemy have his way for a time. The Son was judged. He paid the penalty for your sin. That was that hour. And now the Bible says we live in this last hour, this hour of, an hour of, of turmoil, an hour of darkness, an hour of deception, a time when the enemy is, in a sense, having his way. Now, we've got to be careful with that, right? Because he doesn't just have free reign. I'd like to see it like this. It's like he's got a noose around his neck. And God's holding the rope, and he's just giving a, a little bit more slack in these last days. He's giving him a little bit more leeway, but folks, at the end here, he's pulling the rope. Satan can only do what God allows him to do. Always remember that. God is in charge. Our God is omnipotent. Satan is not. And so John is trying to prepare these believers back in 1 John. He's trying to prepare them for this time. And then he goes on to say, listen what he says, but you Christian, this is back in 1 John verse, chapter 2 verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and so that you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and, and because no lie is in the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And this is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. John says, listen, you know about this. You've been taught about this. You know the truth. How did they know? Because they had this, he says, anointing. Now what is that? What is, what is this, this anointing that, that John is talking about? And to whom does this anointing belong to? Well, folks, I believe that he's talking about the anointing of the Spirit of God. The moment you became a Christian in Christ, the moment you became a believer in Christ, you were anointed with the Holy Spirit. He came to indwell, to reside in your life. And what's the purpose of the Spirit? What is it? Remember what Jesus said in John 15 and 16? Remember, he said, he will take the things that are mine and he'll make them known to you. He will lead you into all truth because why? He is the spirit of truth. Read those chapters. They're fascinating chapters. But that day has already happened. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came and he came permanently to dwell and dwell believers in Christ. And now, folks, we have a teacher. They didn't have to listen to these false teachers who were claiming to have, you know, the, the corner on truth. That was Gnosticism. That was the false teachers. And there's so many different branches of Gnosticism. And John says, listen, you don't need to listen to anything more than what you've already heard from the beginning. And what's that? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You know the truth. You know the truth by the anointing that's been given to you. Do you know, folks, that you can't understand one spiritual truth apart from him? Whether you know that or not, it's the Spirit of God that reveals Jesus to people. And he uses it, how? 
through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says in Romans 1, remember, he says the, the gospel is the power of salvation. It's what brings salvation. And so don't you think it just makes sense that that would be the target of the enemy? He's going to attack the powerhouse. He's going to attack the, the supply center. And that's the person of Jesus Christ and who he is. Folks, there are so many, so many distortions today going around about who Jesus is. And that's, it gets back down to that. Who, who, who is Jesus? Tell me who he is this morning. Just throw out some terms that describe your Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. He's Savior. He's Son of God. The Lord of Lords. He's the Great Shepherd. Yeah. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Did you say the lover of my soul? The lover of my soul. Loyal friend. Loyal friend. Prince of Peace. Mighty Counselor. You say Mighty God? Yeah. Mighty God. The Great I Am. The Way, the Truth, and the Life. What a claim. I mean, no wonder they killed him. I mean, he's claiming... His claims were, listen, I am God come in the flesh. Although he didn't go flaunt that. He didn't go out and say, I'm the son of God, worship me. He didn't say that. He proved it by how he lived. Now he said it in the sense in John 8, 58. Remember, they're, <laughs> they're a little ticked off at him because he's been pretty hard on the Pharisees. And he calls them, really, he calls them children of the, dev of the devil. Well, oh, Jesus, that's pretty nasty. Got to be loving, right? <laughs> Hey, he called a spade a spade, man. And then he, and so they're so upset because they're talking about, well, father, Abraham's our father, and, you know, we, we, we serve him and worship him, and basically what they were saying. And then Jesus says, listen, let me tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. And what was he claiming there, folks? I love sharing with Jehovah Witnesses on this passage because they have a hard time with it. And I love Jehovah Witnesses. I want them to come to Christ, man, the Christ of the Bible. But they picked up stones and were going to kill him because they knew exactly what he was claiming, who he was claiming to be. He was claiming to be the great I am of the Bible. God in the flesh. And they hated that. Folks, Satan hates that. And he will attack that until he is thrown into the pit of hell. The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why one of the visions I have for this church is that every member in this church would know how to share and articulate the true gospel of the Bible. Let me ask you, could you sit down with an unbeliever? Uh, have you ever had somebody come to you and say, you know, I really would like to know more about Christianity or more about Jesus or more about your faith? Or, have you ever had anybody do that? Well, they should. They should be able to look at your life and say, wow, there is something different about this person. And come to you and say, you know, what is it with you? And for you to be able to sit down, and as John talks about the truth here, we know the truth, the, we could share with them the issue of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of salvation. Knowing the truth. These believers knew the truth because they had this anointing. Another thing, and I'll close with this, another thing Satan absolutely abhors, absolutely hates, attacks all the time, is the cross of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want to, people to know or understand. He doesn't want the spirit to move in lives to illuminate their minds to the truth of the cross of Jesus, what happened on that cross. Can you share with somebody, articulate with somebody and say, you know, here's what the Bible says about the cross. Paul says that in him was no sin. 
But for you and for me, he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Isaiah 53, somebody, I think your Sunday school class, if you were there studying that this morning, the suffering servant, the picture seen in the Old Testament by Isaiah. He what? He, he bore our sin. He was, he was wounded. He was beaten. He, was, he, he took our place. He paid for our transgressions. You know, those are the things the world needs to hear about the cross of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't want that out. He'll do all he can for you to keep your mouth zipped. Don't let him do that. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is of this world. If you're a believer here this morning, you have received the anointing of God and you have a teacher that's teaching you, that's leading you. Does that mean that, oh, then I don't have to teach? Nobody has to teach? No, he's not, he's not talking about that. wouldn't be consistent with other scriptures. But I believe what he's battling here is this Gnostic, these false teachers who are saying, hey, you need to hear from us. You need to hear the corner on truth. We, we're this esoteric group that really has it together. And John says, no, you don't need any more teaching on the gospel. You already have the truth. You already have the anointing of God. And folks, you do too. You do too. Greater is he that is in you than he that is of this world. I'm going to challenge you with something. I want you to begin to pray for one person, one person this year that you would have the opportunity to share the gospel with. And you say, that's not very hard. How many people have really done it last year? Think of if all of us in this building, every church member of Good News Fellowship, shared the gospel with another person, began to pray for another person to come into our life that doesn't know Christ, and for God to use us as his instrument to, to share the gospel and to, and to bring someone into a relationship with God through grace, by grace through faith. What would happen? I'll tell you one thing that would happen. You would become ignited with the Spirit of God. You would become so excited about your Christian life that you couldn't sit still. The singing in this church would change. You know, this morning we were a little, <clears throat> did you notice that? You know, <clears throat> I was too, you know, I can't, uh, we gotta be, we gotta come together, folks, Sunday after Sunday, recognizing that we are victorious in Christ and we are celebrating together our life and victory in Christ instead of sitting back and going, here we go again. Church, you know. Shame on us. I don't care. You know, as long as it's biblical, what the singing's like, what the preaching's like, as long as it's biblical, we should be able to say, hey, God, this is your word. These are your songs. We're worshiping you, and we're going to give it all we got. But do we do that? I want us to do that, and the only way that happens is for the real thing to take place in our lives. Each one of us. For us to become people of God who are excited about the gospel and are passionate about seeing other people saved and passionate about coming together and worship. It's only going to happen if the Spirit of God moves in our life. We can manufacture it. Oh, we can. But it's not real. God knows what's real and what's false. He knows. Folks, let's give Him the real thing, let's give Him our hearts. Let's give him all we got. Let's give him our lives. Let's make him Lord. I mean, really Lord. Not just a side loyalty, but the one and all loyalty. Is that what he is to you this morning? I mean, really? I'm probing now, aren't I? I mean, he knows your heart right now. What would he say about your heart? Are, are you that church in Revelation where he would say, ah, 
I don't have anything negative to say about you. You are on fire for me. I hope so. I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning and just ask the Spirit of God to probe your heart. I think we all need Him to do that every Sunday, every day. <laughs> David did in Psalm 51, didn't he? Search me, God, and know my heart. Search me, God, and know my heart. Show me, God, if there's any wicked way in me. Test me, God. Father, Lord, we need you. Father, if it's true, we are living in the last times, God, and I believe it is true because your word teaches that, then we should be a people who are so passionate because the time is short. You could come back tonight, today, any time. Father, we don't want to be ashamed. We pray that we'd see this text here in 1 John 2 as such a serious portion of your word where you are encouraging us, challenging us to be a people who don't have to be ashamed that Jesus is coming. We want to be prepared, God. We want to be ready, Father. So, Lord, help us. Father, I pray for each person here today that you would move in their lives like never before. That you would bring that one person out there that needs Jesus. That you would bring them to cross paths with each person here. And that, Father, you would give us opportunity to pray and to pray and to pray for these these unsaved people. Father, that, that we would have opportunity to sit down with someone this year and really, really be able to articulate our faith, the gospel of Jesus. Father, one sounds a little shallow. We'll take two or three or four, but Lord, we'll start with one. If you could just, Father, move in such a way that would bring glory to your name through our lives God we would praise you forever and we will so God thank you thank you for your goodness thank you for your greatness and we pray this all in Jesus name amen